behind the scenes. I'm Ginger Pak, a lecturer and researcher for Diplo Foundation and active in civil society discussions on IG, Internet Governance, especially as a member of the UN Internet Governance Forum, or IGF, and the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, or MAG. With Diplo, I work on e-diplomacy, cybersecurity, and digital technology and policy, while for the GIP Digital Watch, I work on human rights issues. In all of these issues, rights are particularly important for me, with inclusion being a big part of that picture. Social media and e-diplomacies, however we define them, certainly do expand opportunities for inclusion. This series of monthly web debates focuses on so-called new diplomacies, of which internet governance and e-diplomacy are prominent areas. We explore the, emergent, the emergence of new actors, new tools, and new processes in international relations. As these new diplomacies step into the limelight, it's important for us to engage with you with practitioners and scholars to get a better sense of who is involved and what's at stake. On that level, Sean Riordan has said, my objection to such new or hyphenated diplomacies is not just the lack of intellectual rigor that most display. The inability, for example, to distinguish between agency, process, and subject matter, but also the risk of emptying out the concept of diplomacy. When he asks, what is a diplomat, and where in my mind, he's also asking, who is a diplomat, as new stakeholders become involved in processes where governments are used to dominating. This, in my mind, blurs the definition of diplomacy and even affects the willingness of diplomats to engage, and in particular when we're talking about new diplomacies and changing the rules of the game in some people's minds. I would also add for comparison and consideration the example of consular diplomacy, which generally qualifies as an area of traditional diplomacy, yet does not usually involve negotiating diplomatic policy, and in some ways is similar to e-diplomacy in that its tools sometimes outshine its diplomatic functions. I question whether e-diplomacy is actually an area of diplomacy or whether it is a set of tools used to extend traditional diplomatic communications. This is, of course, separate from areas of digital policy or internet governance, which address cross-border internet issues in the very traditional diplomatic function of helping different parties play nicely with each other. Today's debate focuses on digital diplomacy and what I define as e-diplomacy, and specifically the use of social media. As I've noted, I question the term itself as a diplomacy, seeing it as a set, set of resources and applications. We'll see how my colleagues Elon and Katharina highlight the benefits and limitations of social media for diplomacy and look at the extent to which social media has empowered new actors in diplomacy. According to the Book of Life, which you can find online, diplomacy was a way of avoiding the dangers that come from decisions taken in the heat of the moment. In their own palaces, two kings might be thumping the table and calling their rivals by abusive names. But in the quiet negotiating halls, the diplomat would say, my master is slightly disconcerted. Now, I ask whether Twitter has returned statecraft to keyboard thumping instead of table thumping. In IG, Internet Governance, and even more in civil society, we tend to want to get right down to business and discuss the issues. According to Kieran McCarthy in his blog, when he, ta when he is talking about the technical community that is involved in Internet Governance, especially the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, which manages some of the core uh, functions of the Internet, uh, Kieran says, that is often not how things work in intergovernmental world, where staying on good terms is often more important than the correctness of a specific case. The big problem is that ICANN sits neither in the business rules-based world 
nor the diplomacy-focused intergovernmental world when he addresses the controversy over the assignment of the domain name designation .amazon. He questions who should decide and how when we deal with the Amazonian geographic interests who possibly should have rights above the, the first substantiated application for the appellation, which was made by the business community by Amazon.com. So we have an overlap of stakeholder interests making the waters a bit more murky because it's not just the tools, it's not just the issues, it's the who in my, in my mind. And I ask if social media, digital diplomacy, e-diplomacy, and Twitter diplomacy really support staying on good terms as they distill, distill the issues to 144 characters in black and white and lose the nuances of expression. So these are questions I'm, I know we'll peripherally at least address um, with Elon Manor, who is a PhD candidate, candidate at the University of Oxford, researching the use of digital diplomacy in times of crisis. His recent monograph on the digital diplomacy models of European foreign ministries was published as part of Brill's research perspectives in diplomacy and foreign policy. And his analysis of America's selfie diplomacy was published in Digital Diplomacy Theory and Practice. So we have a wealth of information and background in his points that he'll make shortly. Katarina is a research associate in diplomacy and global governments with Diplo. She works on the interplay between technology and diplomacy, focusing on science diplomacy and the emerging field of data diplomacy. But she has a much wider background and area of interest as she lectures on a variety of topics in diplomatic studies and works on Diplo's capacity building projects and our web, web debates in particular. In, in 2014, she completed her doctorate at the Department of International Politics. So both of my colleagues will have interesting perspectives and I hope that after their presentations, we'll have some input and questions from our audience and perhaps a little bit of debate between us. It will be interesting to hear whether they separate digital diplomacy from digital policy diplomacy, rather, from digital or e-diplomacy as a resource, and then how it affects the larger picture of diplomacy in this intersection and crossover between tech techniques policies, stakeholders, with a focus on social media. Again, the debate and discussion involve all of you actively, so please post your comments and questions in the chat box so we can discuss your input and perspectives on the points that we make as speakers. Elon, can we start with your points and position? Yeah, well, uh, thank you to the Diplo Foundation for inviting me to talk today. And uh, good morning or afternoon to, uh, to everyone, depending on wherever you are. What I'll be talking today about briefly um, is talking a little bit about the advantages of using social media and diplomacy, but also the limitations. Um, and especially how some foreign ministries have tried to use social media in order to overcome the limitations of traditional diplomacy. So when we talk about digital diplomacy and specifically on social media, I think it's helpful to look back at the drivers of digital diplomacy. What caused foreign ministries to migrate online in the first place? And there were three main drivers. The first was America's desire to counter Al-Qaeda's recruitment efforts online. The second was the Arab Spring, which caused a lot of foreign ministries and diplomats to think that they could use social media to monitor conversations in other countries and predict events that could happen in foreign countries. The third was the idea of practicing the new public diplomacy. When we talk about new public diplomacy, we're actually talking about a conceptual turn that took place roughly about 2005 to 2008, in which diplomats sought to create long-term relationships with foreign populations. So the idea was no longer to communicate with the foreign government, but to communicate with the foreign population. And foreign ministries and diplomats started to view social media as a very important tool in creating these relationships. By using social media, the Dutch foreign ministry could communicate directly with French citizens 
engage in conversations with them, receive feedback on their own policies, and even narrate their country's foreign policy. Soon after that, countries started to get interested in the idea of overcoming the limitations of traditional diplomacy. And one interesting example from 2011 was called Virtual Embassy Iran. And this was basically a virtual embassy launched by the American State Department in Iran. Now, in 2011, as is the case today, there were no diplomatic ties between the US and Iran. American diplomats had no way of managing America's image amongst Iranian, the, the Iranian population. There was no way to converse with Iranians. There was no way to build bridges between the two people. And so the State Department launched a web-based platform, or basically a website in 2011, called Virtual Embassy Iran, which was meant to replace a brick and mortar embassy. So Iranian citizens could go online and learn about American history, learn about American foreign policy, read content about the historic relations between Iran and America, but also apply for visas and um, look up information about studying in the US. And this was seen as a really unique opportunity also to engage with Iranian citizens. And there was a chat feature, you could send questions to American diplomats, and you could engage with them in live conversation. So here was really the idea of overcoming the limitations of traditional diplomacy. Now, this website was soon banned by the Iranian government, um, but tech savvy Iranians found a way to get to the site um, even with that ban, and they still do it today. It's still active, and it even has a Facebook channel today in which there's engagement between American diplomats and Iranian citizens. Four years later, in 2015, Israel decided to launch a Twitter embassy to the GCC, or six Gulf countries with which it has no diplomatic relations. Now, the goal here was not to communicate directly with Muslim or Arab social media users, but rather to have the ability to narrate Israeli policies and explain Israeli policies to critical audiences. So the idea here was that the Israeli foreign ministry could use social media in order to overcome traditional gatekeepers, such as foreign governments and a very critical media, and deliver their messages directly to Arab and social media users. And so Israel started to use the Twitter embassy in order to explain its security policy, in order to explain its foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, in order to explain its security concerns, and try to create a receptive environment for its foreign policy amongst very critical audiences. And the third interesting example, launched at the end of 2015, is called Palestine in Hebrew. And this is basically a virtual Palestinian embassy to Israel, which produces Facebook content in Hebrew. Now, the relationship between Israel and Palestine is very complicated. Israel only partially recognizes the Palestinian government in the West Bank. It doesn't recognize the Palestinian government of Hamas in Gaza. And despite this quasi-official recognition, there is no Palestinian diplomatic presence in Israel. So there is no way for Palestinian diplomats to converse with Israel. And so similarly to the Americans and to Israelis, the Palestinian Authority decided to launch a Facebook channel which could converse with Israelis. But here the goal was not to relay foreign policy, was not to communicate directly with another population, but rather to create a positive and credible vision for the future. So what the Palestinians wanted to do was to explain to Israelis what the Palestinian state would look like when it would be established, and so to try and regain support for the peace process. And when you look at this Palestine in Hebrew Facebook page, a lot of the content actually is dedicated to demonstrating what Palestine will look like. So it talks about the values of the future Palestinian state, saying that we will be a liberal country, one that celebrates multiculturalism, one that recognizes the rights of religious and ethnic minorities. Its government will be a democratic government. It will have a willingness to coexist peacefully alongside Israel, and some of the posts even talk about the Palestinian culture of this new state, talking about Palestinian sports and national institutions such as the National Symphony or National Orchestra. And the idea here was to restore credibility to Palestinian makers and also see a resurgence in support for the peace process. So these are three ways in which governments can use social media to overcome the limitations of traditional diplomacy. Now, it's not a new form of diplomacy, but rather a new means for obtaining traditional goals of diplomacy. However, what we're witnessing, especially over the last year and a half or two years, 
is the main limitations of using social media and its impact on diplomacy. Now, if we said that digital diplomacy started with an emphasis on relationship building, what we're seeing now more and more is digital diplomacy being occupied with creating strategic narratives. And strategic narratives are seen as a prism that a foreign ministry can create through which global audiences are supposed to understand events, issues, and actors around the world. The idea by using strategic narratives is to set a specific agenda for the media, to set an agenda for online publics, and to actually influence how online publics and journalists or the media interpret world affairs. And this really stems from the idea of strategic communication and creating and controlling the media environment. And we started to see this very, um, in a quite interesting manner during the Crimean crisis of 2014 and 2015. Now, if you were following Russian digital diplomacy channels, you learned that there were neo-Nazis in Ukraine, that these neo-Nazis had staged a coup d'etat against the legally elected government, and that being neo-Nazis, they were threatening the lives of Russian minorities in eastern Ukraine, so Russia decided to come to the aid of Crimea. But if you were following the U.S. State Department, you learned that there were no such neo-Nazis, that neo-Nazis don't exist in Ukraine, that there's no threat to the lives of people in Crimea, and that Russia actually um, mounted a full-scale invasion into Crimea. So you had two conflicting narratives, but also two conflicting realities. And so the question is, which reality do you adopt and which prism are you willing to take on? So what we see in this world of strategic communication and strategic narratives is it's a world in which diplomats now contest reality. Similarly, this moment, if you follow Russian digital diplomacy accounts, you will read that Aleppo and Syria is being liberated from the hands of terrorists. But if you follow the UK digital diplomacy channels, you will actually read that Aleppo is being bombarded to rubble by Russian and Syria forces. What we have here is an emerging world of conflicting realities. And the problem is that without reality, diplomacy cannot function. Without coming to an agreement about a minimal definition of reality, diplomats can come together and solve problems. If there's no crisis, you don't need to resolve a crisis. If there's no problem, you don't need to solve a problem. And what we're seeing more and more, I think, on a basically weekly or monthly basis, are contestations of reality. More and more foreign ministries focusing on the idea of strategic narratives and demonstrating one reality versus another. And this, I think, is going to lead, has already led, but is going to lead to an actual problem in the function of diplomacy in the offline world. Because if governments can come together and agree on some definition of what's happening, they won't be able to interact with one another. And I think that the North Korean example demonstrates this. Oh, sorry, the North Korean example demonstrates this quite clearly. There's an agreement that there's a crisis and a problem, so there's an agreement that something has to be done. Um, the final thing, which I think might be interesting to look at, is where is the future um, of digital diplomacy or social media use is going to go? And I think that what we're going to see over the next two or three years are three things. First, massive investments by foreign ministries in actually creating algorithms. That is writing code and implementing these algorithms both on social media and on other digital platforms to create tailored diplomacy. In other words, you'll have an experience of online diplomacy similarly to what you have on Netflix or Amazon. Diplomatic messages sent to you based on your opinions, world interests, and even data gathered from other apps. We're going to see more and more countries deploy bots, which are social media programs that are meant to alter our perception of reality. And this is going to lead to a greater crisis in diplomacy because, again, we'll have many conflicting realities. And the third thing is probably going to be increased use of artificial intelligence. I think that in about five years, many foreign ministries won't have a consular department. They'll have artificial intelligence that actually deal with requests for visas and passports. And we're also going to see artificial intelligence used to monitor social media content, analyze if a crisis is going to erupt, and even prescribe what kind of intervention a foreign ministry should do in order to prevent the crisis. So that's it for me. Excuse me. Um, thank you very much, Elon. That was very, very thought-provoking and interesting as you set this, a, a wider stage and a, brought out the link between traditional strategies and the newer, supposedly newer 
um, techniques that e-diplomacy uh, allows. As a matter of fact, um, Kishan Rana made a, a, an interesting comment uh, about that transition. He says, I wonder if before 2003, diplomacy did not commit, did not connect with publics, questioning whether that's actually true. When the French launched Alliance Francaise at the end of the 19th century, or Latvia took interest in improving its image with the U.S. around 1910, they were already working on rudimentary public diplomacy. My short point, says Kishan, is that the break between old and new diplomacy is not all that sharp. And after he made that comment, you actually expanded on exactly that point and uh, uh, proved it. Kishan did go on to mention that uh, diplomacy has always been about relationship building. But today, non-state actors loom larger than before. And I wonder, Elon, if then public diplomacy actually includes a bit more of reaching out to non-state actual stakeholders and actors in the diplomatic circles now, not just the public diplomacy arena. Um, would you like to address that quickly before Cat uh, starts? Well, I mean, we're going down the rabbit hole of definitions, um, which is something that <laughs> yeah. and, and practitioners kind of like to do, um, which is okay, I think. Um, but I would definitely agree with uh, the main premise that diplomacy at its core is about, I, I think in 1987, um, I don't remember the name right now, but someone defined diplomacy as the mediation of estrangement. Basically, the focus here is on relationship building. And it doesn't really matter if you're building relationships mm -hmm. with a foreign population, if you're building and nurturing relationships with non-state actors, or if you're building and nurturing relations with academic actors or even other states. That's basically the basic premise and goal of diplomacy. You have different audiences with which you try to interact and different platforms for doing it. Um, about the distinction between old and new diplomacy, I would agree that even if we go back before the Peace of Westphalia to you know the 12th century, diplomacy still had a similar purpose, sending representatives between different clans and trying to establish relations. What well, we are seeing different with social media um, and other tools, not just social media, is the amount of people that you can interact with, your ability to, um, I think, deliver almost personalized messages, which did, did not necessarily exist before, um, and the ability to hear back from a large portion of foreign population. Uh, 15 years ago, if an ambassador went here in the UK to give a speech at Oxford, he could engage with the 50 students in the room and hear back a few of their questions. If diplomats now commit resources, they can have ongoing investigations and two-way communications with a large, you know, a much larger audience. And I think that that is something new. That is is very interesting, and that is a facet that's t that that becomes the reach of the media right now. Um, I was particularly intrigued by your algorithm diplomacy or the fact that we will have tailored uh, diplomacy. And um, a question that Barbara asked in the chat echoes my concern because if how isolated are we going to become if we're getting only our own viewpoint back at us. Barbara asks or, or comments that the Israeli example that you um, made earlier is a very interesting example of reaching new audiences. With gro the growing personalization of social media, do you think the current potential of these initiatives has become more limited as people critical of Israel might not even see Israel's messages? Mm -hmm. And how will public diplomacy be able to puncture these filter bubbles or echo chambers? Yeah, so I think that this is a, I mean, it's a very interesting um, question. I think that to a certain extent, it could be argued um, that the tailored individual is becoming the ignorant individual. That the more tailored our online experiences become, the more, the less we are exposed to other opinions, be it about politics or diplomacy or even art. Um, and the less we have an opportunity to have our opinion mm -hmm. um, negated or to have um, any debate. And there's a lot of concern right now going around about this idea, these ideas of echo chambers and filter bubbles and basically the breakdown of politics 
at the national and international level. Um, so first, I'm not really sure, or I'm not totally convinced that these echo chambers actually exist, because the recent studies coming out now from different universities that actually even today, if a, per a person on Facebook is likely to be exposed to more various political opinions than a person who is not on Facebook. Second, our online life is not the only existence mm. that we have. We're still active in the offline world. So we see content online, but then we have cooler conversations with people at work. Um, we talk to our friends and family. We hear radio on the way to work. So we're still exposed to a myriad of conflicting opinions. Um, it is an interesting question if personalized diplomacy is going to follow the route, um, and basically, you know, lead to ignorant diplomacy. Um, it's a good question. Um, I think the jury is still out on the answer. We still have to we still have to get some studies to see if this debate about echo chambers really has um, two legs to stand on. That that's fascinating. I, I you make this a really lively, important, trending topic. It's it's fascinating. Um, I, and your mention of Facebook resonated with me as I realized that um, even among my relatives, family, and friends. I see uh, opinions repeated and reiterated that that astound me. So I am aware of different viewpoints just within my own close cir cir uh, circle. So you may be right. There, it may not be as serious as we think. But um, Christiane, in in a comment, said that she sees it as a pretty scary picture painted by uh, Mr. Manor. Um, right now, I think we need to move on and hear Kat's uh, presentation before we continue the debate, because I suspect we could go all day on this subject. Um, just to keep it in mind, Elon, Christian asks, do you, do you see all of your predictions, bots, uh, artificial intelligence, MFA coding, as an inevitable? or other alternative paths that we need to actively consider taking. I do think you already addressed that partially, and I leave that up in the air as we go to CAT and then come back to these questions when the two of you perhaps will discuss alternates and, and alternatives. CAT, could you, uh, are you ready to go? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you, Ginger. Um, it's already been such a extremely lively debate. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the other perspective, so kind of take the take a similar view to Elon, but from the other side. Um, I'm going to focus on social media in terms of social movements and civil society, um, and we'll give a couple of examples and come in some cases to similar conclusions um, like Elon. So um, if you've been following our web debates, you notice we had a couple of um, discussions on new diplomacy. And one of the key elements within this debate on new diplomacy, or one of the defining factors, is this idea of new actors, the emergence of new actors in diplomacy. Um, the argument is often pursued that actors not traditionally present in international relations and global politi uh, politics are empowered by information and communication technology. The argument is it becomes easier to raise concerns for them on a global level, there are new ways of organizing protests and raising points of critique and uh, making their points. So building on that, the question for diplomatic services is how can and how should they respond and engage? Um, in particular, I have um, three examples. I will look at the notion of the Twitter revolutions and will question that concept. Um, I will be tracing so-called scale shifts, and here I use the example of Occupy Wall Street. And then uh, my third example relates to the youth climate justice movement and how they use Twitter during the yearly conference of the parties. And here the question I would like to raise is the question of, is there a new conference diplomacy we should be aware of? So starting with my first example, um, will the revolution be tweeted? Um, we often heard or still hear the argument that Twitter played an important role in supporting social movements and protests in Moldova in 2009, Iraq in 2009-10, and Tunisia in 2010 and 11. And very quickly, uh, the term Twitter revolutions was suggested. However, equally as quickly, 
There was a response, for example, by Malcolm Gladwell, who warned that the revolution will not be treated in the New Yorker article. His point was that the connections to social media do not create the same strong social bonds, the same trust that is needed when you engage in high-risk civil disobedience or protest action. Equally as quickly, another warning came that we should not overstate the revolutionary potential of Twitter. And here Yevgeny Morozov made a very strong case that Twitter, like all social media, like technology in general, is neutral. It can be, uh, it can be used to support human endeavors. It can be used to suppress, suppress those very human endeavors. In, in other words, in equal measure, social media offers unprecedented opportunities for communication and connection, but also control and uh, suppression. Um, now, eight years after the Twitter revolution, the new mantra rather seems uh, to be the following. To create a buzz, go online. To create real social change, go out and protest. So this just as an introduction. I don't want to get into, into the details of the argument yet. But what I want to do is to draw a couple of lessons for foreign services. And the first lesson that emerges is the idea of social media or it relates to social media as a tool. And what we have here are potentials for monitoring, prediction, and reporting. Similarly, and this was a point very strongly made by Elon, there's also an opportunity for communication, for using social media to, to react to unrest, in another country, for example. And then the second point I would like to make um, in this regard, we should not forget that social media is not just a tool for diplomats and diplomatic services. It is also a topic. And in that sense, we need to be aware of diplomatic negoti negotiations, digital policy making. But the question is, how do we regulate cyberspace? And how do we navigate this very difficult terrain between freedom of expression and, for example, countering online extremism. So the this was the first example. The second example relates to Occupy Wall Street. And in this case, I would like to use the example to introduce the idea of scale shifts and the possibilities for tracing those scale shifts. So Occupy Wall Street. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, a protest about unequal distribution of wealth, corporate influence on government, and an unjust economic system began to emerge. And you might remember physical protests emer uh, emerged in the streets of New York and other cities um, around the world around September 2011. And for the purposes here, it is interesting to note that the hashtag Occupy Wall Street appeared several months earlier, namely in July. So the, pro the physical protests we see in September, whereas the hashtag appears much earlier in July. What you have here is um, a tracing of the use of the hashtag for the first two weeks. And we see a kind of low level of engagement, which then takes off, to then actually, well, basically explode. The second image here traces um, a couple of months. And whereas here in, in the first two weeks, we had about up to 800, is that, no, up to 550 tweets um, later on we had tweets ranging in the tens of thousands. So this is what, this is, what is meant by um, a scale shift. And what is interesting to observe is, is how the hashtag gained traction. So at a very low level of engagement, and then people who were connected to different audiences were retreating, were using the hashtag. And so you literally had the scaling up until you had this massive scale shift. Um, what is interesting to note from the perspective of diplomats and foreign ministries is, of course, that such a scale shift can easily be traced. And similarly, network analysis can be used to identify those key people, those nodes in the network that are, that are crucial for connecting um, these um, various audiences. And again, what we find here is the ability to use this for analysis, prediction, and reporting. Um, what I would like to warn here also, however, is that as you can see from this kind of tracing here, it's not exactly uh, a hard science. It's not exactly um, a predictive science that is exact, because um, the use of the hashtag and the actual protest on the ground do not fall together exactly. So now I'd like to move to my third example, which is the youth climate justice movement and how they use Twitter during the yearly conferences of um, the parties. So for example, what I'm talking about here um, are the conferences that take place um, 
at the end of each year. You might remember the 2015 one, which resulted in the Paris Agreement. Um, and obviously, the conference of the party are a venue for negotiation between selected officials. So the very kind of traditional diplomacy we often talk about. But in parallel, there is also a place for civil society to meet, to follow the conference, to communicate their interests, and to protest. And the question I would like to raise then is, how does this, how, how does this relate to social media use? Um, and in a sense, what we find is that the protest on the ground during the conference also translates online. Um, a number of groups critically follow the conference and tweet. However, the example I'd like to share with you is the so-called fossil of the day. So the fossil of the day is an award symbolically awarded by uh, civil society organizations to the country or group of countries that was particularly unproductive during the negotiations on that day. The examples you see on the slide relate to New Zealand and the European Commission. And on the other slide, I have a couple of examples from tweets that were sent by members of the youth climate justice movement during the conference. So without going into the details, I think the interesting question that, raise, that is raised here is, should diplomats and diplomatic services react? Should this be something they pay attention to in their social media use during the conference? So in other words, do we need to rethink digital conference diplomacy or how we use or how diplomatic services use digital media during the conferences? Um, for now, I would say in most cases the answer is no. Yet, I'm including this example to argue that diplomatic services need to think seriously about how to engage with the sensing opinion and critique on social media in a productive way. And we all know that the key skill for social media use is not only sending out information, but more importantly is engaging in a dialogue. So as diplomatic services continue their presence on social media, and as this kind of protest that manages to um, skim the boundary between online and offline becomes more elaborate, I think this will be a very important question for diplomatic services. And one thing I'd like to draw your attention to to um, end my very brief intervention is the fourth tweet I have here. So again, this is from someone from the Youth Climate Justice Movement sent during the negotiations in Lima in 2014. And that person said, random EU delegates chatting by, to sleep or not to sleep? That is the question. So is there a reason to respond to these kind of critiques? Is there a way to do this in a productive way? And this is the kind of question I would like to end my very brief intervention with. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. That is a very, very interesting uh, alternate approach to Ian's, but on the, uh, Elon's, on the, on the other hand, I see that it totally supports what Elon said. Um, I kind of expected with your big data emphasis to have you um, talk more about how big data is involved and go into one of Elon's very important points, which was how algorithms and, and big data will be analyzed and used to tailor our, our messages in e-diplomacy. So to hear your, your different um, takes and even to bring in the importance of the physical world and physical to make actually make change uh, go, go out into the streets about conference diplomacy, corridor diplomacy extended to Twitter, which uh, is an excellent point you made. But you mentioned not just dialogue, as Elon did as well. I'm wondering, um, I, when I started watching social media, I was very uh, reluctant to engage. I'm still reluctant to engage, but I still find, for instance, Twitter to be a, an invaluable source of information. So watching for trends, watching for information, data analysis um, are, are very, very important for what you can learn. So when you said that the second point not just to broadcast your viewpoint, but to dialogue. I actually thought you were going to say for information gathering. Um, I'd like to hear your viewpoint on that, and perhaps Elon would have a perspective as well. Um, 
And then we're going to go to uh, a very important question from Suhila. So would you address, would both of you perhaps like to address that before we go on? Mm -hmm. Kat? Yeah, I, th I think these are some, some very, very good observations. I mean, to break to break down what I, what I said is basically, I think, if you look at social movement, civil society on Twitter, one of the key things for diplomats and foreign ministries to keep in mind is that there are two things. There is um, analysis, monitoring, and reporting. And then on the other side, there is communication. So in terms of analysis and reporting, your question on big data obviously comes in. And I think it's very important to start from where we are now. And in terms of where we are now, social, large-scale social media analysis, big data social media analysis, is used extremely sparingly by foreign ministries around the world. There's not even a handful that engage with this as far as we can tell. It usually takes the form of sentiment analysis, so the idea how is a specific topic discussed uh, in emotional terms? Is it positively discussed, negatively discussed? What are the kind of trends? Um, so this is done, but um, only oh, it's very much at, at the beginning. What we also noticed is that in terms of diplomatic reporting, if you look at some of the reports sent from embassies to the foreign ministry, there's a huge emphasis on, well, the personal impression, what the diplomat sees and hears in a meeting, sees and hears on the street. There are a few cases where this kind of reporting is supplemented with statistics, and obviously even fewer cases where this is supplemented with results from large-scale big data analysis, which is very interesting to note because diplomacy is a traditional profession, and I think there's this extreme emphasis on qual qualitative reporting rather than qualitative analysis, which I think is a very positive, is, is something very positive. I think what I would argue is that in some cases, especially when we look at these kind of scale-up effects that would help us see um, what is going on in terms of civil unrest in certain areas, then it becomes very, very useful, I think. But in terms of the core function of diplomacy in reporting, it is, is very much a, a minor thing. And let me stop there, but I think there's something I haven't answered yet, so remind me of that afterwards, okay? Uh, okay, yes, we will go back to Suhila's question. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Elon has to say because I think that he is, you are the, the data diplomacy person and Elon is actually giving more importance to the, the data analysis, the statistical analysis that will be predictive and will tailor what, how social media is used. So Elon, would you give us your perspective, please? Well, to be honest, I think that we already have, um, almost personalized diplomacy because each one of us is going to see a tweet by a specific foreign ministry in a different place in his feed and it's going to come before and after a different tweet or Facebook post. So I can see a tweet sent by Donald Trump and it comes right before a cat playing the piano and after a friend of mine announcing that he got engaged. You are going to see it in a different place. And so what basically we have is already the context of diplomatic messages that each one of us receives is quite different. And even if you look at Facebook, then the messages and the advertisements on the side and your feed might be actually shaping how you interpret the message. Now, I don't have enough studies on this. Um, I think that there's an American scholar called Marcus Holmes at the, who sits in America who's starting to look at these environments. But it's very interesting to see if that's already kind of personalized diplomacy. I think that where foreign ministries are getting very, very good at using big data is probably crisis management, specifically consular crises. And we have quite a few foreign ministries who have developed online simulation platforms in which the foreign ministry simulates a huge earthquake or terrorist attack happening in another country, and how then you would mine big data in order to understand what's happening on the ground, who needs help, and how you can get to them. Um, I would not be... The, the tension here for foreign ministries is where does diplomacy end and security begin? Because we know that national security agencies definitely have the ability to mine, gather, and analyze big data. And so the question is, should foreign ministries develop a similar capability, or are they simply going to get the analysis from the security services? And the answer to that is going to vary from country to country, and based on that answer, different foreign ministries are going to develop different big data capabilities.
Ginger, we can't hear you. Sorry, you. Yes, I'm sorry. I was trying to uh, minimize background sounds. Thank you. Um, I found that that exchange between the two of you right now very, very informative, very important, and uh, interesting for the development and strategic future of of social media and how we move forward. I did find it a bit interesting that I find I, I thought that the two of you had the opposite positions I expected each of you to take. So um, it'll be interesting to see how controversial that is, and particularly important to see how the background big picture of our own social media feed and ads does affect. If, if we're seeing ads about huge controversy, security, security problems, and at the same time climate change, it's going to change how, how it, we're going to see it perhaps as a more urgent and tense situation than we might have otherwise. I, I hope we in the future we'll a, be able to get um, forward on that. I did want to um, go back, Kat, to uh, Suhila's question. Can you explain um, how or why governments are blocking access to social media? Is it that they feel threatened? Or is it just more difficult to control this form of communication? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, maybe, maybe to come back to, before I answer the question, maybe to come back to one of the points you just mentioned where you said, oh, we're taking very different perspectives, almost opposite to what you would have expected. Um, I very much agree with what um, Elan highlighted in terms of, for example, the use of big data analysis for uh, consular services. Um, I think. Well, where I'm coming from is this kind of um, a cautionary position that there's a core of diplomacy that is essentially qualitative. And the position here is that it's not replaceable by large-scale big data analysis, by AI. And I think that the, the diplomats are very keen to preserve this kind of core of qualitative engaging with the world. Um, so that that's, I think that is my point. But there are very, very important applications for big data, consular services, certain types of negotiations, uh, climate change negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. And also, there's a capacity gap right now that the question is, how do we bridge that capacity gap? In terms of, yes, we have large-scale social media analysis, sentiment analysis that is used by the business sector um, quite prominently. And in some cases, the question is, do diplomatic services need to catch up? In what, way, in what ways can they catch up uh, in a meaningful way that really supports the core function. Okay, having said that, um, the question, why would uh, certain governments block access to social media? I think it's, in, in a lot of sense, what we see is we have a new technology that no one really knows how to use or no one really knows the scope for that new technology. So when we had the Twitter revolution in the 2010s, um, it was a very different situation to uh, what we have now, where governments learned certain lessons from these revolutions. One of the lessons is, for example, blocking of access to social media to, to exactly prevent this kind of scale-up effect. But also, and I think there are two ways here. There is one thing is to control the communication environment domestically. And here we're talking about scale-up effects. Um, but if you look at how these, uh, how protests in the streets usually develops, this is actually not so important because it usually develops by word of mouth. Your friends are going, so you are going. If you have a friend who goes to the protest, you're much more likely to also mm -hmm. go to the protest. A tweet you see will be much less important. I think it comes back to Malcolm Gladwell's argument that I mentioned in my presentation. The actually risk you take by participating in a protest or by going to the streets in a repressive regime is so high that it depends on social bonds and trust that can usually not be created by social media. Um, so this kind of domestic perspective is one aspect. And the other aspect is to control the communication environment outside of the country. If you look at the so-called Green Revolution, so the unrest in Iran in, I think, 2010, uh, one important factor was the fact that the diaspora was very prominent on social media in bringing that message, in tweeting in English, 
in bringing the message to Western audiences and then mobilizing support. So by blocking social media access um, internally, it's also a way, in, to some extent, to control what kind of information gets out and what then can, um, what kind of information can be spread. So I think these, these two things um, are at play here. And I must say, that kind of blocking of access to social media, we do see this um, more and more often. And I think it is a lesson learned, if you will, from those. Uh, uh, thank you for, for addressing that point. Um, I know if, if you, you both of you have been so incisive and with your comments and so interesting that I think we could carry this, I could carry this debate on all day. But unfortunately, we do have time limits. So I would like um, to see, to hear, Elon, if you have a rebuttal position to cats, not to the social media one, although if, if you have any points there, please feel free. But going back to cats' uh, comments right before that about the analysis and um, personalization again, um, she seems seemed to me, to, or I heard her contradict the importance of the data, the data analysis, and the fact that it's already being implemented, and how it can affect our our own feeds, and what we're doing right now. How is it being used, and how is it? being implemented, again, asking you to take the big data position or addressing any other wrap-up points that we might have missed. Yeah, so, Elon? I think it's, it's important to remember when talking about the crossroads between diplomacy and technology that diplomats are social beings and diplomacy is a social institution. Um, conversations that happen in society at large will lead to conversations within foreign ministries. Trends that happen in society at large will have an impact on how diplomats view technology and how they're willing to use it. And fears or um, um, issues that pertain to technologies in society will also have their impact on diplomacy. So it's not two distinct realms. If a diplomat is reading day after day newspaper articles about how Facebook is a threat to democracy, when he goes to the office, this will impact the conversations that they have. And I think this also um, will influence how and when foreign ministries might choose to use um, big data. But I don't think that big data or any kind of quantitative analysis is at the end of the day going to completely replace um, the insight of a diplomat. And I think that this was evident, mm -hmm. I think that this was quite evident when WikiLeaks happened. Um, I don't remember now if it was 2011 or 2012. But the main conclusion that came out of WikiLeaks, and this was the dumping of about 250,000 secret U.S. cables, was that diplomats uh -huh. are very are foreign policy experts. They're very good at analyzing situations that happen in different countries, um, formulating policy response, and relaying these um, um, relaying what what they've been able to analyze to the foreign ministry. And I don't think that that's ever going to replace be replaced by data. Um, or even by any form of quantitative analysis or AI. Um, so I don't think that we're going to see diplomats disappear anytime soon, or we're going to see the basic function of diplomats disappear as well. We are going to see a growing attempt to use digital tools in order to leverage one's position. And this can take form in many, many ways, from um, sentiment analysis to exactly analyze what kind of message would work best in another country, to identifying online trendsetters and getting them to deliver your message online. Why focus with trying to communicate with 20,000 French citizens when you can communicate with 10 trendsetters online and they'll carry your message to more and more people? So mm. I think that that's what the future is going to look like. And if there's growing concerns in society at large about filter bubbles and echo chambers, that's also going to penetrate into foreign ministries and might lead to a pol policy response. I mean, uh, I think it's Denmark that already has appointed an ambassador to Silicon Valley. And part of his job is to bring these tech companies to the table in order to discuss where data ends and privacy begins. That's a very interesting point, and bringing a business sector in as a legitimate actor in diplomacy, which is normally the purview of of governments. Kat, do you have a wrap-up uh, statement and response? 
or any any points we didn't make mm -hmm. that should have been brought up? Mm -hmm. uh, not so much in response, because I think on, on most topics, um, Elon and I very much agree, especially um, just uh, on this last statement, for example. Um, just to wrap up, I think engaging with social media is part of digital diplomacy. We see social media as a tool. We see it as, as a topic for discussion, but we also see it as an element that empowers new kinds of actors to emerge towards their concerns and actors um, such as, for example, the climate youth justice movement um, that we should think of how to engage with productively in a kind of communication on social media instead of just sending out nice polished uh, tweets. Um, in terms of, um, there's one thing uh, Elan mentioned that um, I would like to pick up on because he spoke about, in his presentation he spoke about that if you look at social media and how diplomats and foreign services engage, but also basically how we all engage with social media, it's a question of different realities. Um, the point of how do we engage with these different realities and the contestation of those different realities. And I think this is also an important area where diplomacy needs to get to work. The idea of if we have different realities, we do not have a ground to negotiate on. So the key task for diplomats is to intervene, to kind of deal with these diverging, diverging realities in a productive way, I think. And that maybe is the new big task for digital diplomacy. After diplomatic services learned how to tweet, the next question is, how do we engage with this diverging realities on Twitter? Thank you, Kat. Um, these are very important and interesting perspectives. I hope we can follow it up again um, to continue some of the points that we just didn't have time to address in depth. I would close with uh, a quote from Vint Cerf long ago and that we often talk about. Is He said, that the internet is a mirror of society and that reflects some points both of you have made um, and especially the comparison of online and offline worlds if we take your your going to the street analogy one body might not make that much difference although you say if you want to make change go to the streets what happens is if there's a focus on one person like the violin player in Venezuela who simply stood in the streets and played his violin. That's the equivalent, I think, of going viral with a tweet. So we have similarities there that we do bring and that I, I perceived today in, in both of your interventions. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much for your interest. Thank you very much to our participants because the debate continues with an audience, and we need all of you to engage with us. I look forward to seeing you in our next uh, in our next debate. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you in class, Kat. A lot of you in the audience.